have a wife. I have nieces. I don't have any daughters, but you know, I have other relatives, aunts. If if they come to you and say, "Hey, you know, I've been wanting to do this breast implant thing," you know, what would you say to them? Like, what honest advice you would give them in terms of pros cons and just in terms of big picture? Because you see the worst of the worst. Right. You've also seen people do well. We also want to live in a world where people are given choices, given information. And uh, But how would you approach that conversation so that they can walk away feeling like you've honored their desires while also, uh, you know, made them understand here are the things you need to worry about? Welcome to the Protecting Your Nest podcast. If you are new to this podcast, the foundation of the podcast is my nest and rope acronym. The NEST reminds us to focus on nutrition, exercise, less stress, more sleep, recovering from trauma, and protecting our thoughts. And the ROPE reminds us to have healthy relationships, avoid organisms and pollutants that harm us, and to protect our emotions. And of course, to make sure our life experiences serve us. Today, I don't want to, I want to focus on the P in the ROPE acronym, which focuses on avoiding pollutants that may harm us. But another term for pollutants are toxins, and toxins are substances that are harmful to humans, and they can be in the form of things like bacteria as well as environmental toxins like metals such as lead. As a general rule, we should avoid toxins because of their potential adverse effects on our health. They can lead to allergies, uh, other symptoms, and in some cases, even death. So, So with so many people interested in looking their very best. Today, I want to talk about the potential toxic effects of breast implants and what we need to know to avoid the harm they can cause. And I'm going to do that by having a guest by the name of Dr. Robert Whitfield. He is a board-certified plastic surgeon, has 26 years of experience specializing in breast implant removal surgery, breast implant illnesses, and advanced cosmetic procedures. He's uh, highly sought after because he's really good at helping people who have had breast implant illness, and and he's mastered this uh, art of removing uh, breast implants and reconstructing breasts when it's needed. I'm looking forward to having this conversation. I've had too many people in my family and my patients uh, have interest in breast implants, but I think it's important that we always think through uh, pros and cons, risk, benefits before we make these types of decisions. So with that, Dr. Rob, I welcome you to the Protecting Your Nest podcast. Well, thank you for having me. Sorry I missed you in Chicago. Oh, yeah, I know. I, you, 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 you've you briefly uh, shared that you were just recently here. And now that we are new friends, we'll make sure <laughs> the next time you're around and we're available, we, we connect. And I think that's really awesome. I really appreciate the work you're doing. Uh, It's really nice that there are people out there who are not only providing surgeries that we need, but also helping us when things don't go well. So so I kind of gave a little bit of an intro. Anything else you would like to share about yourself uh, that your audience, my audience should know about you? Yeah. So, I mean, for your audience, my background is in oncologic reconstruction. So I practiced at a tertiary care center for many, many years, uh, very near you in the West at the Medical College of Wisconsin in Milwaukee, uh, often referred to as the Western suburb of Chicago. And uh, there I took care of patients with sarcomas, which are cancers of fat, bone and muscle. I took care of breast cancer patients and I took care of head and neck cancer patients. So my background is in oncologic reconstruction and dealing with um, the effects associated with those treatments. So in the breast cancer population, many patients will undergo a placement of a tissue expander after mastectomy and then conversion to a permanent implant that was traditional, that's done all across the country in community-based hospitals. So everybody should understand in... um, you know, there's a certain percentage of women who will get breast reconstruction. Predominantly, that's done with a breast implant because that's the predominant form of reconstruction practiced in community hospitals, which are smaller hospitals around the United States. The United States has over 300 million people. So it's impossible to just find someone like me who trained in microsurgery for a long period of time and did your reconstruction with your own tissue because 
that's typically the purview of a center that has a higher level of care or a, a group setting, either an academic or private, that has a group of surgeons who do microsurgery. So that's what I did predominantly. And during that time frame, of course, I was given patients who had complications after radiation therapy or with capsular contractures or with problems with their implants. So I either had to convert them um, to their own reconstruction, which is called autologous, using your own tissue. So think of the tissue that's discarded in a tummy tuck. We would do a procedure that spared the muscles and nerves connected to the blood supply, taking that tissue from the abdominal wall, the skin and fat only, and reconstructing the area with a breast. Now, when we or to form a breast. Now, when we did that, we would always take all the capsular material out. And in the nomenclature that's um, on social media now, it's been referred to as an on block resection. So, on block is a pathology term, meaning you don't want to be inside something, you want to be around it, basically. So, when we take things out, we don't want to stir- disturb things in a cancer setting, obviously, because there could be recurrent cancer or there could be an infection. So, I would take all those out in the same manner is how I was taught using oncologic principles to look for recurrent cancer or evidence of infection and then do the tissue reconstruction. Moving forward, obviously, I gained a lot of experience in taking care of implant problems. So people would come to me with implant problems. So I had a lot of uh, methods to help with those. Those are very complex problems depending on the therapies the patient had received. Okay, that makes sense. So I can kind of see how you landed in this uh, implant space. You actually, it's interesting how you land anywhere. I was just talking to uh, Dr. Uh, Yvonne Collins, who used to be at Advocate Health where I work. She's a, she's more of a gynae oncologist, but she did that for quite some time within our health system. I think she worked at like three hospitals. They didn't have a lot of people just like you, she's kind of specialized and not a lot of people are doing that work. Now she's actually the chief medical officer for Cook County Care, and we actually had a, a, a live stream uh, the day before our conversation uh, where we shared wellness principles uh, for the community, a lot of Medicaid folk who are trying to heal. And, sure. and that kind of makes me think about you. Uh, most uh, surgeons are not necessarily holistically minded, and I'm curious how, where did this holistic mindset for you come from? I think... <clears throat> For me, I've been very curious since um, going to college about genetics. I grew up in the 80s going to college and um, medical school in the 90s, and I was very interested in genetics. I was very interested in infectious disease and, and thought I would always go into virology. Um, the AIDS ec- epidemic basically was happening while I was in college, and uh I went to a traditional university, I got a traditional biology degree, and but I really, had I had my uh, ability to go somewhere and do something else, I would have just studied virology. I thought it was the most fascinating topic. And uh, I went to the Institute, National Institutes of Health with patients who at that time, Heidi Broadbent, I don't know if you remember her, but uh, Janet Jackson made her you know, very prominent because she was the youngest and the longest surviving person with AIDS. So I traveled with her to NIH and uh, they were trying to do their best to help uh, protect her and keep her immune system um, strong enough so that she could survive. And uh, there was an interaction I had there and at the institutes, because uh, I was gonna do a, a Howard Hughes Fellowship and go into infectious disease. That's, I mean, I, that's what I wanted to do. And uh, the uh, director at that time, and I'm, I can't remember his name, he said, oh, you know, Rob, basically, we really help take care of people. We consult on cases. And sometimes the surgeons even let us take care of their patients. And it struck me as odd. But it makes sense now because I'm a control freak. I micromanage things. So I couldn't be a consultant. And um, I went to Indiana University just south of you. And I spent an entire eight years at Indiana University Medical Center in Indianapolis. I was taught by phenomenal um, surgical mentors, um, and they are of the ilk of when IV nutrition started. So things like parental nutrition with TPN basically came about while they were training, and they passed all those things on to us. So when my general surgery training began, the focus was on becoming a very, very solid clinician 
And if you weren't a solid clinician, you would never be able to operate on their their services because that was not the principal foundational knowledge base you need. You needed to be able to take care of everybody because back then, if you remember, surgeons didn't ask people for help. We didn't ask for consultations. We mm -hmm. had to take care of everything ourselves. Yeah. There were no hospitalists. There were no critical care physicians. That was us. Right. And then when I advanced and completed general surgery training after six years, I did plastic surgery based, you know, based on what I wanted to do, which was perform oncologic reconstruction using microsurgery. But during that time frame in Indiana specifically, we were the regional burn center. So everybody in Indiana who suffered a, you know, above a 20% total body surface area burn was referred to us. And hence, you know, I became basically, I, I, I did over a thousand burn cases and we cared for all the children and all the adults who were burned. So for everybody listening, the only, you know, the things that are, uh, allow burn patients who are, who are badly burned to survive is appropriate resuscitation, which meaning maintaining their fluid balance and then prompt uh, excision of burn tissue so they don't get infected uh, with temporary coverage before you can permanently take care of them. But most importantly is their nutritional status. So we did all that. So when someone asks me why I know anything about nutrition, I often think of like, I've probably forgot more about nutrition than most people will ever know because we used to have to have people get indirect calorimetry, which is anyway. <clears throat> so you had to monitor their CO2 production. These are very complicated cases. So I was super fortunate. I was trained at a time where, and I look back on it, you can't go back and, and do that type of training anymore. It doesn't exist. The, the work week changed the day I finished general surgery. So um, the 80 hour work week started the day I finished general surgery, which really didn't matter over the six years I had already put in. So when someone says um, they're trained in any equal type manner, I, I kind of just in my head think, no, I don't think so. You never. Yeah. So, yeah, I get most of my uh, I had to you had to literally get a master's in nutrition because I didn't learn a lot. But I agree with you that in order to help people heal or recover, you have to think about the big picture. Uh, if you don't like think about, okay, I've done my part. Now I have to do this other part. And I think it's nice if we can live in a world where you have a team that's really doing all of these different parts. But again, the team has to be aligned in terms of how to do it. And if they're not aligned, that could be a problem. It'll kind of take you away from some of the things that you're trying to achieve. So, so that's, that's basically what I've done with this. The care of a breast implant case is how I was fit into the multidisciplinary cancer team. So I've transitioned how I, some of my most intellectually stimulating times were sitting in conferences and they would present a complicated cancer case. And I would have to think of how I would help take care of that case. But I would only think of my role in that case. Mm -hmm. And uh, the radiation oncologist, the care coordinators, the other surgeons involved with the case, it was always a multidisciplinary conference. The radi you know, the, the, instead of trying to interject and take care of everything. You had everybody playing their roles. And so for me, when I take care of a, a case now, I have <clears throat> health coaches on my team. I have uh, functional providers. Yes. I have a clinical psychologist. I have mid-level providers who are nurse practitioners. We have people who just focus on detox. I have a lymphatic masseuse i have a very very if you get the picture uh multidisciplinary approach to it and then the program developed uh, by me is called sharp so i'm trying to be very de deliberate but strategic about how i approach the problem i'm very specific about someone's genetic uh, ability to detox so for the listeners i look at everybody's vitamin d pathways how you metabolize your B vitamins, and we could talk about methylation and MT, HFR, which are, are you know becoming like 
part of the vernacular these days, how their liver functions and their uh, ability to metabolize chemicals and, and deal with these things that they're, they're constantly exposed to now. And then their antioxidant pathway, and everybody's heard of vitamin C. They know what that is. So that's an antioxidant. But if you have trouble and limitations in those pathways from how you inherited them from your parents, it really challenges you from a detox standpoint. If you combine that with a lot of exposures, so you're in Chicago, you live by the L, you may get exposed to different things. I live in Austin, I get a lot of mold exposures. That gives you a whole list of exposures that are chemical, mycotoxins from mold, and or heavy metals from water or from the air or whatever. And then those things will throw off your gut microbiome. Maybe you don't eat well. Maybe you eat processed food. So if you, for your listeners, if you eat out of a bag, you can't be my patient. All right. If you eat out of a box or bag, we're going to have a long talk and you're going to have to go through my program before you ever come to me and see me because I don't operate on people who eat out of box, uh, bags or boxes. And then we look at food sensitivities careful because the food supply is such a problem. You have to be very careful about what you're eating in order to avoid further, you know, gut inflammation, which leads to all sorts of problems with the gut brain axis. Uh, you'll get hormonal imbalance. And my patients are predominantly women and they're very sensitive to these problems that affects their thyroid and sex hormones and cortisol levels. And so it becomes a very complex equation to take care of. Listen, that's, again, my, my master's in nutrition was also functional medicine. So you're preaching to the choir, uh, not exactly what you would expect to hear from a surgeon. I love the fact we're talking about, you know, you mentioned coaching, functional medicine, thinking about what's going on in the brain, obviously detoxing, making sure your lymphatic system's working. Now let's circle back and think about a lot of people who will see the thumbnail to this video will, you know, be very interested in, you know, okay, I'm thinking about this possible transformation with breast implants and I am going to get a consultation. Now, I know you're kind of on the end of helping to fix what didn't go well, but when they're faced with a doctor and that decision, is there, are there certain things they should be asking their doctor about to make sure that that doctor, not necessarily is thinking at the level you're at in terms of all of these things we just shared, but uh, you know, what questions should they be asking so that they know that they probably should even consider this procedure? Well, I think that's the, the root problem, right? So they don't, I don't think about problems from a ICD-10 diagnosis standpoint mm -hmm. anymore. I just listen and I'll ask you, like, if you get a cold, how long does it take you to recover? So mm -hmm. that'll give you some inclination on how they methylate. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if they have a, a sluggish liver, they'll have and give you different kind of cues when you interview them. <laughs> If they have lots of fatigue, you have to be very concerned. They've already had a problem with an exposure like mold in my area. I'm just going to say specifically with my patients. But that can also lend itself to a very specific problem with their antioxidant pathway. And the enzyme is SOD2, as you know. So if they have a defect in that pathway already, they'll have a lot of fatigue. And so if you ask them, like, hey, what kind of exercise do you like to do, Tony? And you say, oh, I do F45 or I do HIT or I do Peloton. And, I'm like, okay, Tony, how long does it take you to recover? You're like, oh, man, two, three days sometimes. Like, so you don't methylate well. So that's automatically, you shouldn't be doing that. So you should either do a low impact weight routine or something that's not so stressful for your system. <clears throat> so I don't, it's not that I don't ask the questions that we were taught. Mm -hmm. Right. I think about them a little bit differently and I accumulate information to arrive at what I consider to be and, and I see a very specific patient now. So uh, they're coming to me with this problem. And I have to think about it from a genetic standpoint and a toxicity standpoint. And then I map out how to help them. So if you're coming on the front end, which is your question, like, all right, I have an 18 to 25 year old or I have a 35 to 45 year old who wants a breast augmentation. How am I going to help them make an informed mm -hmm. decision about this? It's a different conversation for me because I know a lot more about genetics and toxicity and gut health. So when you're younger 
and people ask me all the time, would you let your daughter get implants, Dr. Whitfield, or would you let your wife get implants? And Well, the short answer is my daughter's a Leo and I'm not going to tell her what to do at all. So I'm a Leo. I know that. So my whole stance is providing enough information in a format that somebody can understand to make what we all want is an informed decision. You're never going right. to stop anybody from doing anything. That's, That's right. not the tact. Mm -mm. So I think what my audience and what your audience should understand is implants are not going to go away. They're used in hip, knee, breast, head and neck, cardiac, neurologic problems. They're just part of the, the program. So what we can do is think about them in a different manner. So people ask me, well, what's the alternative? So I do a lot of fat transfers and they're like, oh, fat transfers. What does that mean? How does it work? And, okay. We all have stem cells. So mesenchymal stem cells are what are associated with your fat. So when you remove fat from one place and transfer it to another, it's your own genetic material put in the proper position, which is the subcutaneous space just beneath the skin. It'll heal. It'll give you more volume. The issue is the concept of yourself and what you want to appear like. So whether that's from an image in a magazine, TV screen, whatever, the body image or your playbook, according to Amanda Savage Brown, who's our PhD, who's in Chicago as well, she says, that's your breast playbook. And so if you think this upper pole fullness is what you want, you're never going to want a fat transfer because that's not going to give you that. That's an implant all day long. I can't make that. And so if that's the playbook, you're never going to get a fat transfer. And a lot of people are too lean when they're young, right? And we get older, we gain weight, we have thicker uh, tissues. And then it's easier kind of in that, whatever, 30 to 45 range when someone's had children and they want to do some type of rejuvenation procedure. And I do what's called a holistic mommy makeover. So I just do body contouring or sculpting and take fat from other areas to rejuvenate breasts. And I can get an A plus fat transfer result, but that's not going to look like an A plus breast augmentation because the image that someone's thinking of is not the same as reality. So I don't want to get too far in the weeds, but that's something that starts early in life. So the number one graduation gift for a long time in Texas was a breast augmentation, mm. which is kind of a gross thing. But in general, you know, people try to pigeonhole me all the time about this. And I don't want to, you know, or I'm not a zealot one way or the other. I take care of people who have problems. I know implants are never going away. That's right. We just want to make an informed decision to help people get the best possible outcomes and take care of them throughout their lives in the right manner. So you take care of people with nest and rope. And basically, these are all very similar with what you know I do. I'm yeah. trying to yeah. limit the overall inflammation that you experience, which controls how you behave in your, your epigenetic age. And so things like telomere lengthening and everything, these are all subject to inflammation so that we're all on the same page when That's you right. lower inflammation then you will have a better chance at living your best life i believe that 100 percent. and 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 there's multiple ways to get there i um when they uh, did the twin studies that's on netflix um one of the things they talked about was the telomere length and they felt in that very short eight week study which is we can talk about that not being long enough but there was improvements, but then if you Google, you know, telomere length for keto, you'll see improvements. But I think most of those correlations are related to inflammation. Just like you said, if you reduce inflammation, you're probably going to give yourself a better chance to live longer, healthier. And I think that's the root cause of much of what we suffer from. I do think though, when we, when we think about risk, right, one of the things that I would worry about as a doctor is okay, a person's in front of me and they're interested in implants, but maybe there's a family history, rather it's on the father or mom's side for uh, breast cancer. Are people in that, you know, in that category, the people you say, maybe that's not a good idea because there's a family history or is it more a broad thing? We'll look at the total person and how they're living. You said epigenetics. We know our environment and what we do impact our risk. So What's more important, that 
family history to epigenetics? And are those people candidates for implants? Yeah, there were several studies done uh, about this. And it, having a device doesn't increase your risk. So that's been shown. Um, I think as we learn more and more about the code, your code specifically, you know, it, it's more of how, you know, you can manipulate genes by what's going on in your body. You'll turn things off and on. So <clears throat> I think the, the way I look at it more simply is if I do my best job and you do your best job to lower each individual's total inflammation, then we'll be doing the right thing for them and their specific genetic makeup. So, you know, some people are going to have in breast cancer a really toxic estrogen environment, and that's more of the issue. So I really ask them questions, and it's probably, you'll find this odd too. I'm like, okay, so tell me, now this is a plastic surgeon, Tony. So I'll say, all right, tell me about your menstrual cycle, and I'll have somebody young, and they'll get uncomfortable. Yeah. And I'll say, do you have really difficult times with your period? Do you have PCOS? Do you have endometriosis? Have they told you these things? So these are a consequence of toxic estrogen metabolites. So they need to have a better handle on controlling what they can control through use of DIM and Crisin, which are supplements that lower these metabolites. And so these are not complex discussions, but mm -hmm. nobody's had them with them. Right. And then they're like, you ask the mom, because I have a lot of daughters and moms right in front of me. And I'm like, do you have this problem? Did you mm -hmm. have this problem? And they'll chime in you know, right away. And I was like, this is an inherited problem. Or if you have a child and they are literally a knockout of the mom and dad. So the mom and dad were heterozygous for methylation, you can tell. And then this one's homozygous because mm -hmm. she can't do anything. Mm -hmm. And so not to belabor it, but I think if we go back in training or in, in school, our school, like I'm older than Google. Mm. Right. So when I went to the library, we still had books. <laughs> and right. Medline was on a disc. So I used to have to load, just like you did, a disc drive yeah. to go look yeah. something up. So we're older. I'll be 55 in August. Yeah, we're right there. And I, I, I want to say that it's going to take a period of time. But if you now use the Genome Project in conjunction with what you learned, you will be a very effective clinician. Mm -hmm. But if you yeah. don't, you're going to frustrate people. And that leads to distrust and dissatisfaction. And overwhelmingly, they don't, they'll like, Tony doesn't know what he's doing. Mm -hmm. He doesn't understand me. And then they'll go seek out more functional care because they'll get somebody who's like, okay, well, let's look at this. Let's look at some uh, toxicity testing or genetic testing. And I have no problem with holistic practitioners. I created a program to train them specifically on how to recognize the signs and symptoms and take care of these patients because they're complicated. And if I sat in front of you and I said, oh, I have uh, brain fog and I have headache and I have light sensitivity and sound sensitivity, and I have difficulty swallowing, my heart races and I have shortness of breath and my joints hurt and I, I get bloating and swelling and constipation and I, I have uh, you know vibration symptoms and I have shooting pains and burning in my arms and legs. You're going to be like, what in the hell are you mm -hmm. talking about? Mm -hmm. This makes no sense. And all those things are for your audience are the end game of chronic inflammation. That's right. And that's what I see. So breast yeah. implant illness for everybody listening is a chronic inflammatory process. A breast implant is a component of it. It's not the only component of it. And when, if you just, from my perspective, if as a surgeon, just does an explant with the capsule material, that's just one aspect of the care of the patient. If you don't do the rest, you'll have people that get better at, say, 90 days or six months or 16 months. So what, what are the differences? The differences are programmatically how they detoxify from a genetic standpoint. What are their exposures? How is their gut functioning? What are their sensitivities and hormone balance? And when you look at all those collectively, you'll give them a treatment plan then they can roll with and get better using. Yeah. Sounds like a, a lot of um, potential problems occur. Sounds like when you're 
looking at the person in front of you, you're trying to kind of understand how they got to where they are. And it also sounds like you're trying to optimize them so that no matter what you do for them, they have the best chance to recover. Yes. And, and so, so when you, so, so is there a big gap between I met you, I see where you are foundationally and I, and I, and I know that I need to fix a few things. Is there a big gap between, okay, I, I'm, I'm going to meet you today and how long does it take between, do they have to be kind of optimized to a certain extent before you would do any of your procedures? Yeah, so I have people come from out of the state and out of the country routinely to do this procedure and get a fat transfer at the same time. So it's a little bit uh, nuanced for those patients. I want to know everything up front for those patients. So there's a lag of a probably, you know, four to six, four to eight week period of time where we get all that inflammation or uh, information accumulated and then a treatment plan developed with my detox team and a surgical plan and start them on. Uh, so all of my supplements are geared towards people who I already consider to be malabsorbers. So most of my uh, supplements, barring two, are not caps or tabs, they're liquid. So they're all, I think from a baseline, I consider everybody I see nutrient deficient. So for all of your listeners, if you're nutrient deficient, then every process in your body is struggling just to keep up and you'll have trouble, trouble on all levels, cognitively, you know, from every system in your body, it will behave at a, at a micro level at a, at a reduced rate. So we're constantly trying to level that up so that your immunity can, you know, come up and then your absorptive capacity. Once you've had surgery and began the healing, you know, journey, if you will, will have a team work with you on getting your gut better. Like yesterday, this will <laughs> this will resonate with you. I had a patient come in who went to university, immediately got exposed to mold just when you listened to her. Gut stopped working well. Had a had a, a bad acne breakout. So this is a young person, female, new you know new environment in a school, trying to do their best. That's a pretty bad combo. You don't mm -hmm. feel well. Your appearance is changing. You have bad periods. What do they do? They go get put on Accutane, which will just completely mess up your brush border in your gut and give you leaky gut. And then everything just goes off the rails and continues to be a problem. So you've got a lot of work to do with a young person like that. This is a young person in their 20s. So for the rest of you know, maybe they're alive, they're going to have different types of absorptive issues and hormonal imbalances because their nutrients cannot get absorbed at the level they need to in their gut to then help their gut brain access work properly. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's fair. You when I'm, I'm just thinking about the young person who uh, may hear this conversation and, you know, again, like you said, people are going to have breast implants and, and for good reason sometimes, right? You mentioned cancer earlier. So how do we, is there a way to ensure that before they need you, <laughs> that when they're in front of somebody who is going to do this procedure, that they can, is there a way to help them optimize? You mentioned there's things that you give them to help optimize their body, but what what do they do when they're kind of faced with a conventional doc who may just be focused on surgery. They're not thinking about functional medicine. They're not thinking about coaching. They're not thinking about detox and any of these things, which may then make the procedure go well. Yeah. So kind of how do they, what do they do in that situation? Are they, should they partner with a functional medicine doc or, you know, and just kind of try to optimize in that space as well while they're doing a procedure for an implant? How do we, kind of give them hope that there's a way to, so that they won't even need you down the road. Yeah. Yeah. So I think what I would do first and foremost is, and this is a food discussion, you know, all day long for me. So I think it just starts with diet. And as a young person, when you have a really, really strong metabolism, you kind of uh, will take 
a different tact. And so you may eat fast food, you may eat chips, you know, what, whatever. And so I would say fundamentally, the things you can do on your own to help yourself are to eliminate gluten from your diet. So this will resolve one key inflammatory component that I see. And then I get a lot of criticism for eliminating dairy. Um, but for obvious reasons, based on the supply of dairy and how it's, uh, you know, processed in this country, we'll just say that, that is a, a, if you do those two things, you're already helping yourself a lot. Mm -hmm. The other like basic things are from Robert Lustig's book, Metabolical, and you cut out, you know, fructose and sucrose. So, you know, orange juice, natural orange juice is not sweet, not to the degree that it is in any of the manufacturers because they've added things to it. Of course. So stop eating cereal for breakfast and having a glass of orange juice. So those things right away will just help you. And then basic supplementation, I would say for women especially, is, um, and I always, you know, defer to liposomal things that I know that they'll absorb it. So the liquid-based liposomal D3K2 is foundational. Um, I think if we just want to assume that people don't methylate well, then a methylated B complex that's liposomal with trimethylglycine is important. A liposomal glutathione and a liposomal, we'll just say simple vitamin C. So those are just four supplements. They're liquid. You can take them every morning. They're not complicated. You will not get pill fatigue. They're not overwhelming. And you can take those and not suffer any dire consequences from too many B vitamins or anything like that. And then what I've added to our inflammation bundle to round that out is just glucurate and glycine. And so these are all like simple things. And, and just for everybody listening, like if you're going to embark on a journey to get surgery, these are what I consider just basic things. Mm -hmm. yeah. So when I was taught and Tony was taught, I would get like a complete blood count. I would get electrolytes. I would mm -hmm. get an EKG and I would get a chest x-ray. And so these, I'm old, right? This is, this was the workup. So I don't do any of that anymore. That's, that should have already been done. These are, you know, the things I'm looking at are nutrient support for prep to ensure proper intraoperative and postoperative recovery. Well, it was funny. <laughs> I did a pre-op yesterday and it's so funny because a lot of those things you mentioned, they did get ordered because the anesthesiologist would have a fit if you didn't order them. But I agree, like this optimizing yourself is not being done in conventional medicine, which is why I asked the question. And even if you do a gluten sensitivity test and you pass, or even if you think you tolerate dairy, but for the most part, all, most humans after the age of two uh, are not going to be able to break down dairy. They don't have the enzyme to break it down. So there's a good chance it's going to cause, even if it's subclinical, it's going to give you some types of symptoms. Mo wheat, rye, barley, all of those gluten things, even if you don't have celiac disease, are likely to cause some level of inflammation in your gut. And we already know, and I appreciate you bringing up Dr. Lustig, um, uh, high fructose corn syrup is, uh, for all practical purposes, poison. And I do agree that like I had a vitamin D3, K2, I do, do that every morning, but I agree. I like liquid. I just think it it's more bioavailable and I'm, I'm not following, you know, swallowing a handful of pills and some liquid, liquid supplementation. I do appreciate that. If I were a young lady wanting uh, to have an implant, what's the chances that I'm going to walk away. Now, I've, clearly, if I do the things you're suggesting, my chances of complications are less. But percentage-wise, or give us an idea of what's the chances I'm going to walk away and have a complication that will then require further intervention. Perfect. Before I answer, I'm going to, I, I, gosh, I forgot one thing. I apologize. So I really harp on people now about seed oils. Oh, yeah. So um, there is yeah. an app that you can get on your phone called Seed Oil Scout. So oh. the 
and I'm in Austin, Texas. And um, so that everybody who comes to visit visits me understands. And when I do a consultation or when I have a patient um, who's going to have surgery, I give them a gift card to a restaurant called The Well. Mm -hmm. And The Well in Austin has two locations, downtown and where I am in Westside Hills. And so the point of this is, it's not for Tony and I just to discuss how to do this. I tried to give you an example in real world terms of how to go eat. So this right. restaurant has no seed oil. Mm. It has no gluten and no dairy. Mm. So I converted all of my, I, I, I want my patients to understand I'm not giving lip service to this. This is not something I don't do. I eat there all the time. It drives my wife crazy because I just go there to eat. And, you know, your wife wants to go out somewhere else. Right. Eat, right. So, but they have the best bone broth. Bone broth is an excellent source of protein, mm -hmm. chicken, mm -hmm. beef, vegetable. I don't care. I'm not opposed to anybody's diet. I will tell you that it is very hard to take care of vegans because they don't get a lot of protein. So that's fine. But we have ultra pea protein as part of my program. There's this uh, vegan bone broth. We have uh, amino acids that are broken down and, I did a whole show about collagen. People ask me about collagen incessantly. So collagen is a huge molecule that can't be metabolized because of its size. Mm -hmm. has to be hydrolyzed. Mm -hmm. So I don't care who's hawking it. I don't care what person, famous person is telling you to buy it and eat it. That's right. You can't really, so you can't absorb a huge molecule. It has to be hydrolyzed. So when I, when I think of like, who do I see? So that's, the question is, over time, who's going to have this problem? And so over time, when I do a procedure and I take out the device with the capsule, we send everything off specifically to make sure there's no cancer. I've had three people have different problems with cancer diagnoses, one a breast cancer. Um, that was uh, pre uh, when I was working them up, when I found during surgery, and then after surgery, there was a lymphoma. So if that's my wife, your family member, that's one too many if it's not taken care of properly. So right. over time, that's a really low incidence. What's more important is about a third of them have a biofilm. So for the audience, a biofilm is a collection of bacteria typically that are on the surface of the device between your scar capsule and the device. They can create a, we'll just call the film, which is like a sugary coat that makes it so your immune system cannot clear it because the device, hip, knee, breast, dental, cardiac, neurologic, is not alive, it has no blood supply. So once your body sees that, it wants to eliminate it. So you rev up your immune system. And that's how it becomes, over time, a chronic inflammatory process with a combination of your genetics, your toxicity exposure, your gut health, your other sensitivities and your hormone balance. So all these things are interconnected and people ask me, well, how does that happen? How do you get a biofilm? Mm -hmm. All right. So there's three ways. So if a surgeon gets handed an implant, it can be contaminated by the staff who hands them the implant upon opening delivery, whatever. If that doesn't happen, the surgeon could contaminate, contaminate it upon placement or within the scope of the procedure, which is those first two are extremely low based on surgical technique and sterility and the operating room uh, behavior. The third is hematogenous. That means somehow bacteria gets our bloodstream and gets spread throughout the body. So that could be a cut that gets infected. It could be a cold. It could be a urinary tract infection. Anything that leads to bacteremia, which is blood in your uh, a bacteria in your bloodstream, can lead to attachment to an implant. This has been known forever. This is not new or earth shattering information that I'm giving you right now. That's that right. is the most common way. And it's always going to be the most common way that this happens. Nice. You're uh, providing hope for me. And I hope for my listeners because you're a surgeon and you're saying things like inflammation. You're saying things like interconnectedness. And you're also... What people, when I, when I think about a guest for this podcast, uh, obviously I'm thinking about the nest and rope. And, and for you, I was thinking about toxic exposures, right? So you kind of fit that. But what I didn't do is understand fully, how does he feel about nutrition? I had no clue you were going to say, 
high fructose corn syrup, uh, which is essentially sugar, and the inflammation that comes from that. I had no clue you were going to say anything about seed oils and uh, gluten. All of the things that I know are harmful, but I don't know that my surgical colleagues know that those things are harmful and how critical it is to avoid those things. And so, and even when I start with my kind of low carb discussions in clinic, I'm not necessarily uh, initially talking about seed oils because I don't want to, you know, scare them too much, you know, and give them too much. But I, but I do understand that those types of things cause a ton of problems. So I try to give them Uh, I try to get them started, and then we'll kind of just add to that as we move along. But I just really appreciate that you've taken the time to kind of look beyond the surface and and really help people learn how to heal. So so it'll be way beyond just an implant. It'll be way beyond, you know, because if you reduce inflammation, you you solve like eighty percent of the health problems that exist. But but one of the things I think people are gonna want to hear from you particularly for this episode, is, okay, what's in that breast implant that is toxic for some people? Uh, what is there, is it the, 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 what it's made of? Have they gotten better in terms of giving us, you know, uh, materials that you can put in your body that are not as harmful? Has that changed over time or is it still uh, not as good as it should be? Well, I think from implant technology standpoint the shell technology is superior to the first implant was placed in 1962 by conan and in um, houston and so those devices had uh it was brand new right so you go through iterations and we're now on our fifth generation of devices and they have better shell technology and the filler which can be saline or silicone if it's silicone it's more like jello gelatin. So it doesn't go places. It's not like syrup. So from that standpoint, the short answer is obviously in silicone is yes. In saline, it hasn't really changed because it's still filled with sterile saline. And it really goes back to the shell technology. Now I did a show uh, with Lauren Bostick of the Skinny Confidential and she used a barrel sauna. And so for everybody listening, that gets up to between 200 and 220 degrees. An infrared sauna can get between 130 to 170, depending on the vendor. So I've taken a fair amount of grief for this, but in my patients who are having symptoms, we'll just say, I don't recommend they do any of that because you can create a environment for leaching. So the chemicals that are composing the shell, the metals, lead, cadmium, tin, all these things can come into your system. So everybody associates Sweating with detox, which of course is a thing. Um, it's one of our ways to uh, eliminate waste. We poop, we pee, and we sweat. And we respire, so we breathe. But if you're heating yourself up with a device, I can't competently tell you how it's affecting you. And if you tell me you're symptomatic and fatigued or have what's called a Herxheimer reaction afterwards, I would say for sure that's a problem. So... I, I think for my patients, so that your audience understands, when they are interviewed by me, I ask them, are they using a device, a IR sauna or a, a, you know, a, a, a dry heat sauna? And I just ask them politely, like, hey, I've had this experience. I'm probably one of the only people in the world with it that knows that you can leach chemicals into your system. And I have the before and after talks reports to prove it. So I would say for your own wellness, just wait until you have an explant procedure and don't detoxify. And I'll, I'll go a step further. Don't go through a functional medicine detoxification program that can actually make you detoxify at a rate that can make you unwell. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> so I get a lot of providers really trying to help and I just want them to understand. So I see 30 to 50 people like this a week. You may see two people a month. So this to me is old hat. Mm -hmm. And I know how and created a program and, you know, people could pre-order a book about the recovery program. And I'm writing one about breast implant illness now because it needs to be understood better instead of kind of through the social media channels. So 
if, if you're experiencing symptoms, and I, I alluded to some of them previously, you got to tap the brakes on how you're trying to deal with it. Because until you recognize the underlying device problem, which may be a hip, breast, knee, whatever, it, it's not ideally, it, it, you're not in an ideal situation to detoxify, especially as it relates to breast. The others I can't discuss because I don't take care for those you know, patients. I've read reports in the literature and say, for instance, a shoulder implant is in a unique position to get uh, exposed to what's called QD bacterium acnes, which is the main bacteria that I find on over 1,100 consecutively tested PCR or PCR tested samples. So everybody will remember from the pandemic that PCR testing became like the thing which was a research technique. It looks for the DNA fragments of bacteria. So I have each of our samples from the patient's scar capsule, not the device, the patient's scarring, tested for 150 different types of bacteria, fungi, mycobacteria. And predominantly, this is a, a problem of bacteria. The bacteria is cutie bacterium acnes. It's found in high concentrations on your chest, face, neck, and shoulders. So there are tons of reports in the literature about this as a complication of implant-based surgery, shoulder surgery. So I'm just using it as an example so that everybody understands, like, if we're going to, you know, talk about it, we just have to give, you know, scope to the issue and what is the issue and how do you get there and what are the other things that we have to be paying attention to. The program I run is meant to help prepare and get you through a surgical process, whether it's cosmetic, orthopedic. OBGYN, cardiac, whatever the process is that you're going to undergo, you would do well with getting prepared before you go see that uh, surgeon. So the SHARP program runs so that everybody will have a better chance at a more efficient recovery process by optimizing themselves in the pre-op period, whatever that period may be, if, if we can do it as an elective procedure. Nice. So you're... And this program is just for people who are coming to you wanting to get um, care and is to optimize them for what you're going to do. Is it also for people who are thinking about, you know, the procedure, maybe even right. another surgeon? Yeah, I thought um, I was being too narrow in scope by just focusing on this, this group. So this uh, SHARP program is my platform to help everybody do better. So the audience is not just my audience, it's really your audience and the entire audience who's considering any type of surgery because as you alluded to, the providers at any level don't necessarily understand or know what I'm talking about mm -hmm. or what you're talking about. Right. And they're focused on doing and providing the best care they know how to provide. So I would just encourage everybody, if someone's uncomfortable with both the care plan or, or what you want out of it, then you just have to, from a surgical standpoint, never ask a surgeon to do something they're not comfortable with. That's not what you want. Yeah. Yeah. So if you go to a surgeon, you want to explant, they're like, no, I don't really like that. It's got a lot of complications and da, 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 da. To me, that just is somebody who's either not experienced or not comfortable and you don't want to make that person in the operating room uncomfortable when they're caring for the patient. So I train surgeons to do this and I train practices to run our program. And we have the book to help the audience understand there is a different way and a more efficient way to do a pre intra and post operative recovery process. And that's why our team is set up the way it is to expand and help care for people. So it's not everybody can come to Austin and have surgery with me. But our teams will be available, our practitioners will be available, and the long-term vision is to have centers around this country and in Europe and other uh, uh, locations to help provide this type of care, which I think is crucial for this patient population. But in reality, it's helping everybody level up how they can approach their procedure. So I know you have a drrobertwoodfield.com site. So if someone goes to that site, is that how they can learn more, get access to that type of program. Yes. So you can engage with us on social media at breast implant illness expert at Dr. Rob Whitfield. And then the URLs are drrobertwhitfield.com, breast implant illness expert.com on YouTube, breast implant illness expert and Dr. Robert Whitfield. All right, cool. Real quick. 
you know, when I did research for you, I I learned that implants can impact uh, sex drive, which is kind of ironic because uh, one of the reasons why we want to have nice breasts is that it'll be attractive to our mate, right? So talk a little bit about libido and impacts that that may have. Yeah, I think uh, it goes back to our inflammation discuss- discussion. And what I see routinely in patients with and without implants is in females, thyroid dysfunction. And so they'll get a lot of problems with hypothyroidism right away. And to me, when you develop inflammation, it seems the thyroid is uniquely sensitive. It goes off first. And then what I see on evaluation is a lot of testosterone suppression. Mm -hmm. And women only need about one twelfth the amount of testosterone we need. So I find it really an underappreciated phenomenon in women that it's suppressed and we don't know why. My working hypothesis always that it is inflammation. So how I treat it, and I'll I'll give you my perspective because I've done this for a number of years and taking care of patients with complicated cancer diagnoses or burn diagnoses, like I said, we know androgens like testosterone will help heal. We've done studies on that. and We know that will help improve your healing. So in my program, when you come to my office, you'll spend about a week or two depending on where you're coming from. If you're from out of the country, it's a minimum two weeks here. If you're in country, it's uh, our continental United States, it's about a week. I have people in from Hawaii right now. So if someone has suppressed testosterone levels on uh, their preoperative evaluation, we'll use a a plant-based pellet to augment that for that four months around the time of their procedure because I need a couple things, and you'll understand this. So I need to lower their inflammation. I need to upregulate their androgen, which is their testosterone level during healing. I need to augment it with protein to get their oncotic pressure high enough to act like a siphon to get the fluid out of their tissues. I use hyperbaric oxygen in my office. I have a chamber. Everybody comes in on the day after surgery, get hyperbaric. One, it clears brain fog quicker, helps them clear anesthesia quicker. But you know what it does. It upregulates wound healing at a faster level for you. So, and then I have a a German lymphatic device. I have a lymphatic masseuse, like I said. So our our hacks are augment your uh, lymphatic drainage increase your androgen levels, increase your oxygen levels, increase your protein content, decrease your gluten, dairy, seed oils in your diet to lower inflammation. And that's, you know, that's the trick, if you will. Yeah, real nice. Okay, so kind of one of the final questions is if you, I have a wife, I have nieces, I don't have any daughters, but, you know, I have other relatives, aunts. If if they come to you and say, hey, you know, I've been wanting to do this breast implant thing, you know, what would you say to them? Like what honest advice you would give them in terms of pros, cons, and just in terms of big picture? Because you see the worst of the worst. Right. You've also seen people do well. We also want to live in a world where people are given choices, given information, and uh, But how would you approach that conversation so that they can walk away feeling like you've honored their desires while also, uh, you know, made them understand here are the things you need to worry about? Yeah, we have a new relationship uh, called Envision Labs, which is a very forward thinking genetics company that allows us to look at both all those pathways, uh, hormone metabolism, um, how they uh, are set up to uh, metabolize carbohydrates, fats. Uh, proteins in their diet, and then how they sleep. But actually, a new hack that I think is important is how they metabolize drugs. So opioids, things that are used in the operating room. So we'd look at all that, plus their toxicity exposure. So it's really running our program to give them a, you know, a better pre understanding of like what you potentially could face. So I would say in somebody who has lots of limited detox, and already say they have exposures i would counsel them like if you're going to do this like these are the things you need to understand this is how you detoxify from a genetic standpoint these are already your exposures so you need to understand this i think when you give people their information and you explain to them like okay this is the benchmark this is what you are right now at zero and these are the things that need to be addressed if you're going to do any surgery 
If you're going to add a foreign device, well, that's even going to complicate the discussion because this is a non-like entity, right? So mm-hmm. that's the the rub, right? You have to protect yourself if you're going to do it. And then how is the best way to do that? Well, it's your diet, your exposures. And, you know, it's very hard because we take for granted like getting a cold or, or getting a sinus infection or getting a UTI, which women are obviously more predisposed to. So I think once you understand it, if you can get that, it's it's a lot. So, um, you know, I, th- I think the it goes back to being and making an informed decision with the patient so they can understand it better. Cool. I appreciate that. I just wanted to make sure we level set that. I am so thankful that we have uh, resources that will help people make better informed decisions. There's no resource uh, that's perfect. I'm sure, even as they're trying to come up, what's that best diet, right? And you can test for it. There's no, there will never be a perfect test. And a lot, a lot of that is epigenetics and how that, you know, going back to the twin study, if I have one twin living in California and the other living in New York, and who knows what exposures they're getting that's right. affecting their genes, right? So I just love the fact that we do have some tools to help us make better decisions. And, and I think that's helpful. So so now the question I, I ask all guests is how they plan to protect their nest. So when you think about the nutrition, exercise, less stress, more sleep, our thoughts, recovering from trauma or the relationships in your life, avoiding organisms and pollutants like we talked about today, or just your emotions and your life experiences. When you think about the next 12 months, how does Dr. Rob plan to protect his nest? Yeah, I think the biggest thing for me as both a surgeon and entrepreneur is self-care. So I never really took care of myself. And uh, now, just before I came on, I can get up on uh, Monday and Wednesday and I go to work out at, at 5.30, which for about 10 years, I wasn't very consistent about that. And I have eliminated in uh, Q at the end of last year and throughout this year, seed oils. I've been gluten-free for a long period of time. I don't ever eat dairy. And um, I don't have a DEXA in my office, and I haven't had one. But just doing that routine, I've lost about 10 pounds. And it's mostly, I would say, just fluid weight. I feel much, much better. And for everybody, I'm a kind of a biometric freak. So I check my HRV all the time with a whoop strap. And I encourage everybody to look at these types of things like heart rate variability and, you know, if you work on yourself, things will get a lot easier. Yeah, and I love uh, I love data because data uh, gives us information, and again, it allows us to have information to make decisions. Knowing that no expert, no study is going to be perfect, but at least you can say I've vetted this before I've made a decision. And I just think that's a better way to live. So, Dr. Rob, I appreciate the work you're doing. Uh, It was uh, a pleasure to get to know you during this recording. And I just really wish we had more people in the world, particularly in the surgical space, who can pause and think about why this person got sick in the first place. And how can I then get to the root cause of why so that they won't get sick in the future? So I just think that's a better model. And that's why I'm thankful that there are people teaching people about functional medicine and they're helping us to see the world through a different lens. So any final thoughts before we wrap up this episode? I think it's underappreciated, the diet. So I, I harp on that the most. If someone wants to make a change today, yeah, stop drinking soda, yes. stop eating bread and pasta, you know, pick your protein, make sure it's a good source that's not been hormone fed, it's pasteurized if it's uh, beef or chicken or, or whatever. Don't eat out of a, a box or a bag and get up in the morning and do something. So if you don't like your life or if you're not happy, get up in the morning, go for a walk, That's right. do something, get grounded and exercise and things will get better. I agree. And, and we'll make sure... Uh, to share the resources you have. And and I agree. And uh, yesterday was a nice day in Chicago, the day before this recording. And uh, today is a little cooler. So it was a great day to get out and 
connect with nature. So Dr. Rob, thank you so much uh, for sharing your insights and, and we'll make sure those who are interested in learning more have access to your resources as well. Thank you very much for having me on. I appreciate it. Absolutely. So today, guys, we focused on the P in the ROPE acronym, which focuses on avoiding pollutants that may harm us. Everything we do in life involves risks. Some risks we really don't think about, like the quality of the air we're breathing right now. Uh, and, and some we don't take seriously, like when we get in our cars and drive, which is probably riskier than flying a plane. So, so when you're making decisions, and, and, and it could be something like going, undergoing a breast implant, right? Just make sure to pause and to think through the risk. Make sure you take advantage of resources like Dr. Rob so that when you're deciding risk benefit, you can know, okay, here's my risk. If I decide to do it, here are the things I can do to optimize myself. And just taking that approach will likely lead to you not having any complications and, and more importantly, being satisfied with that decision in the first place. So, so I really hope today's episode uh, was helpful uh, as we talked about the potential of negative effects of breast implants. And I just think if you know anybody in your circle who's contemplating breast implants, this may be the episode to share with them. And, and it's not to discourage them, but to give them more information. So in that way, they will learn how to protect their nest as they're making life decisions. So, so make sure to share uh, and comment if you have any thoughts about what you learned or, or you have further questions, uh, just put those in the comments and we'll you know try to circle back and get that back to you. So I always appreciate your time and your commitment to wellness as you check out episodes of the Protecting Your Nest podcast. And until we do it again, continue to be safe, be well, and continue to protect your nest.